Welcome to the Signpost Inn podcast, a space at life's crossroads for a refreshing pause and a bit of reflection. My name is Brandon, and I'm really glad you're here. I invite you to join me and my friends, Matt and Peter, for a friendly back porch conversation about prayer, Christian spirituality, faithful theology, and much more. So pull up a chair, grab a drink, and get comfortable as we start today's show. And when we're done, don't forget to visit us at signpostend.org to find out more about all that our ministry offers. Hello, everyone. So glad to have you with us on the back porch today. Today, I'm excited to be joined by two friends. First, our very own Rachel Gamble, who works with me here at Signpost End Ministries, and our special guest, Emily P. Freeman, who's here to talk to us about her Wall Street Journal bestselling book, The Next Right Thing, A Simple, Soulful Practice for Making Life Decisions. Welcome, Rachel and Emily. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah. Emily, I'm excited to talk to you about the book. I, I'm excited that you are willing to take the time to talk to us about it. Rachel and I have read the book kind of together and have talked about it here and there in the office. And so we were, it was fun when I was, when I made the connection that I had another connection through which I knew you. And I was like, oh, I wonder if I could get you to talk about your book. <laughs> so I appreciate you being willing to do so. Before we launch into questions though, and we have a lot, Would you take a little bit of time to just tell us about yourself, maybe your background, who you are, where you're from, why did you write the book, The Next Right Thing? And along the way, maybe you can tell the listeners a little bit about what it's about. I would love to. Well, like I said, thank you for having me here. It's an honor to sit with you and to just have a conversation. As I sit now, I'm in North Carolina. So that's where I live. And my husband, John, and I have been married for almost 22 years, which is very hard to believe. It feels like I can't believe it's been that long, but here we are. We have twins who are just finished their first year of college and then a son, our daughters, and then our son is getting ready to finish his sophomore year of high school. And, you know, as far as my work goes, I like to say that I really love to hang out at the intersection of creativity, uh, faith, and also discernment or decision-making. Those are the types of conversations that if you get me started, we might be here all night. So I just, (laughs) and and especially where those three things align and kind of when, you know, if there's a writer who is also, you know, writing about their faith, who also is working to discern kind of their next right thing. I'm Mm. like, listen, Mm. sit down, let's have a conversation. So that's kind of kind of what makes, what makes me come maybe most fully alive. So I I also spend a little bit of time teaching a couple times a year out at Friends University where I teach in their master's in spiritual formation program and I say teach I'll put quotes around it I'm a residency lecturer which in the academic world it matters what words you use for what you do so I really kind of approach that work with a spiritual direction posture where I hold mm-hmm. space for the students and I do some lectures some listening some kind of faux group direction and I, I love that work because I find that I do my, probably my best work or feel like my best human self when I am with a smaller group of people over a longer period of time. So that's why that mm. student, they come back, you know, the next semester. And I really like that. And then finally, I I do some work as a spiritual director, one-on-one mm. kind of working with people. I, I have a small handful of directees right now. So that's where kind of a lot of that, that posture comes from. But as far as the book goes, you asked about the next right thing. So the next right thing came out in 2019. So we've been celebrating some anniversaries recently for that book, but it really came out of what was first a podcast called the next right thing that we started in 2017. And really the whole concept of doing the next right thing, first of all, for full disclosure, I did not come up with that phrase. Hopefully that's obvious. There's been a lot of really smart and lovely people who said that before me and hopefully will continue to say it after me. But the idea is basically I have found indecision, the moment of indecision, when we have a decision to make, to be ripe with potential for formation. And Mm -hmm. because it's at that moment where we stand at a threshold of, should I do this or that? 
or having to choose between either two great things or two terrible things or one good and great thing, but you don't know which is which it is such a moment where we are opening ourselves up to either direction or wisdom or inner Mm -hmm. wisdom or advice. And all of that is like fertile soil for our own formation. Dallas Willard talks about, we're always getting a spiritual formation and everyone has one, but the question is what kind. And so that's really kind of where I come from in this conversation of just doing the next right thing, because I think that it is a formational conversation, though I don't lead with that always, but I think here I can, but I yeah. think it's a, it's a fascinating, I, I'm still not sick of it. I feel like I should be, but I'm still not tired of talking about the rich flourishing that can come from, we hate it, but it's here in decision when we have a decision mm-hmm. to make. Yeah. Yeah. I, we were just talking about that right before you got on, Rachel and I were getting ready. And I was like, I wonder if she's sick of talking about this yet. <laughs> and, and that's, but I understand why you're not like, I, f- I have that similar feeling, right? It's it, yeah. it, the, those most difficult points of indecision, those most difficult points of sometimes paralysis even are also the most fertile, as yeah. you said, and to be able to, to be able to witness someone's growth in those times, that's, it's yeah, quite a privilege. So it, it's worth pointing out, I think to the listeners, just that I met you in the Anamkara Spiritual Direction Apprenticeship. And so that this all kind of flows together with what we do, making decisions, spiritual direction, making space for people. It's just so valuable and important to what we do. One of the things you said, I want to just ask you really quick about you, you were, can you say more about formation? And what, what do you mean by that? What do you mean when you say the point of decision is, I think you even kind of said talking about opening yourself up to formation. I'm not sure if I'm saying it the same way you said it, but that's what I heard. So could you say a little more about that? Yeah, I think, you know, the phrase formation or spiritual formation, it's been defined and could be defined in so many different ways. But I think just in my own experience, and it won't be a clean definition, but I think this idea of we are always becoming someone. And I hope that I am becoming more fully myself, who I am made to be in God's mind and God's idea of me and our idea together. And, but we're always becoming someone. And so I think that for me, formation is how, how am I becoming more of who God had in mind when, when God thought of me in the world Mm. and How can I participate on purpose with the Holy Spirit, with with God, with the divine, as I continue to move towards becoming myself, as I flourish, as I pay attention to what I love, as I pay attention and honor what I don't love, as I engage in what we maybe have heard, depending on your spiritual background as spiritual disciplines or soul care practices. I like to think of those as really just that the focus of attention is not the practice itself. The focus of attention is always union with God and connection Mm -hmm. with God. And therefore anything can be a spiritual practice. If I do it with an awareness of, and an acknowledgement of the presence of God with me. And so all of that engaging in those practices of being a person on purpose is what forms us. And so when I think about formation, that's, that's what comes to mind for me. Rachel, you were going to say something. It was A, reminding me of The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. Very good book, and I very admire what you're saying there. I think in the first chapter of your book, something that really struck me is you said in our Western culture, when we make decisions, we always feel like it needs to come to a logical conclusion or we need to have a logical analysis before we jump to a decision or instead of paying attention to ourselves or to God, we are paying attention to the others around us and what they're telling us to do. I guess I'd love to hear you expand upon that kind of your own experience of making decisions and how you've learned to pay attention to yourself and practice the presence of God in that moment and those nothing spaces, I think, as you called them. 
Man, what a great question. Thank you for asking it. And I'm glad you pulled out the, the location of in our Western culture, because this is not necessarily true all around the world. But for the purpose of our conversation, I do think most of us who have this kind of Western mindset, and we've, this has been, we've been trained this way, is we think that if we can define it, explain it, footnote it, predict it, then we can understand it, whatever it is, right? And if we can understand it, then we have some measure of control over it. And sometimes I think that, and, and let me just say, this is a version of control that I have deep compassion for. I do because, you know, I think that maybe there was a time, maybe when I was a bit younger, when I maybe had judgment for this, like about either towards myself or to other people or anger about it, like, oh, control, it's a bad thing. And the good, bad binary is one that is increasingly becoming less and less one that makes sense to me. And I think that we're living, I'm living in a lot more grays lately, but we want to know the why of a thing. And that is kind of a way of collecting data so that we can make the best decision possible. And, and like I said, there's, there's so much compassion there. And I have like buckets of kindness towards ourselves for wanting that. But I think there's something to be said for, even though it's like, we know in our minds that we can't control outcomes, but that doesn't keep us from taking the credit or taking the blame when things happen. And so I think that your question, you know, thinking about decision-making my own life, like I'm saying all these words, but also one of the reasons why this is a topic that continues to be interesting to me is because I struggle so deeply with it on a daily basis. It is not something that I feel naturally good at. I do think that we all kind of have a, a giftedness toward a certain way. I think I do have to a degree, a, a gift of discernment, but it doesn't always apply to me. <laughs> and so I think that that concept of, and, and you kind of asked about it a little bit already is this idea of control. And I think it's important to think about the difference between control and agency that mm -hmm. Maybe control is agency, but with a closed fist mm. agency is deeply important for our flourishing and the ability to have a say in our own decisions, the ability to make a choice. Not everybody has that. And a lot of, you know, depending on your own history, your, li your lived experience, a lot of us have grown up without that sense of agency. And I think it's really important that, that people in growth have that sense of agency and our own decisions are a part of that being able to make decisions as a part of that. But when we begin to grip how our own agency and the decisions we make in that space turn out, I think that's when control can kind of come in and, and, and have us become really afraid of making a move at all because mm -hmm. we're afraid it's going to be wrong or turn out crummy. It strikes me. And it's so interesting. The distinction that you're making there between agency and control. And first of all, I'm just glad that you have buckets of compassion for those of us who still struggle with control because I don't have that for myself. Of course not. You know, right. Honestly. Never. Right. Right. And it's, it's just nice to hear that someone does. Thank you. But, but yeah, I, I guess that is a distinction I hadn't, I don't know that I've really internalized, but I felt it. Like, I know what that means to say, I have agency here. I have freedom here. I can make decisions. And I just, I think within my own life experiencing that, that is something I desperately need. Cause if you take that away or worse, you know, control me and stop me from having that, then that stunts me and all of us. But there's that it's, it's so closely connected. It sounds like it's kind of what I'm hearing you say It's closely connected to there. Well, here's the thought I had. It's actually, you don't have, you almost take your own agency away when you grip the outcome so strongly, because then any decision is, is dangerous and scary yeah. and impossible to make. So yeah, that's, thank you. It's like, we can tear it's, we terrify ourselves and yeah. we can talk ourselves out of our own ability to listen to our own life or listen to the life of God within us. And you're exactly right. It is like we're take we have the agency to take away our own agency. That's a really interesting way to think about it. Yeah. Well, and I, I find with myself, but with people that I speak to as well, that there's a, you know, I don't want to use too strong of language or anything, but it's almost a kind of self 
abuse coercion mm. where it's I'm so afraid of making a mistake, whether it's actually a mistake or not is beside the point. I'm so afraid of making a mistake, so afraid of doing something wrong, sinning, whatever else, that paralysis results. There can be no possible decision, let alone a good decision. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think one of the things that you like the way I connected to that and Rachel was kind of getting at this already is this idea that you you talk about about being addicted to control. I don't know if I want to push that analogy too far, but how do you can you say more about that when you talk about being addicted to control in the in the book? You know, I I agree with you. I I don't speak about addiction in a psychological way, but more just in a conversational way, and I think mm. I'll I'll just say it like this. I think in the most basic definition of the word we're all addicted to something. I mean, you know, I, I think that's probably true. I think we could all make an argument for that. Mm -hmm. And I think the moment of indecision often smokes out what that is that we're addicted to mm. when we have a decision to make, or when we are put under pressure for having to make a move. If we're maybe, for example, I can't relate with any of the things I'm about to say, just kidding. <laughs> I can relate with all of them. But if we, for example, are addicted to approval, then in our decisions, we're maybe seeking out advice from other people, from everyone else. And we value everyone else's opinion and perspective above our own. And that will impact the decision we make. If we're addicted to data gathering or information hoarding, then perhaps we will procrastinate on making a decision because there's still more I could learn. I don't have all the information. And so we're afraid to make a move because we just haven't read all the books yet. We haven't collected all the data yet. Maybe we're addicted to activity and hustle. We're someone who just likes to be on the move. And let me tell you what, not always, but sometimes those pesky decisions slow us down mm -hmm. and they put a speed bump in our life, especially when they involve other people, God forbid. Mm -hmm. And so what we might tend to do is we we're addicted to that pace of life. Then we mm -hmm. might just either make decisions quickly to have them out of the way, perhaps mm -hmm. dealing with some regret later, or we might delegate a decision that actually was ours to make but we just didn't want to deal because it was going to slow us down. So I think those are maybe mm -hmm. some examples of how our own personal, you know, addictions, you know, addictions light, I'll say, can inform for better or worse, how we make our moves. In the book, you talked about the gift of indecision. It can either be love or fear. And that's reminding me what you're talking about, because as someone who definitely does not have this problem, but a friend I know, when they were deciding to move to Colorado, when I was deciding with my husband, it was like this uncomfortable space of like slowing down and our pace of life. He finished seminary, he finished chaplaincy and kind of being uncomfortable with like, are we going to hear from God? Like, are we scared of like, what if we make the wrong decision? Like you're talking about, I'm wondering if you can expand upon what you said about that gift of indecision of either love or fear and how, yeah, how that impacts our decisions, how we make decisions. I think in any given moment, and you can just, you know, take this and you can tell your friend about it later, you know, <laughs> just write it maybe down. Maybe we should just title, maybe we should just title a whole podcast asking for a friend, you know? Right. <laughs> You're just asking for a friend. It's fine. It's fine. Sorry. Go ahead. You mentioned love and fear. And in any given moment, I think we all are confronted, whether we realize it or not, with the choice of, Am I being led by love or pushed by fear? And sometimes it's both. And sometimes maybe it feels like neither. I'm indifferent. But I do think it's a helpful question, at least a helpful starting point when it comes to decision-making. You mentioned a, in passing, but I think it is profoundly important question that we hold. Those of us who are, who are wanting to live life with God in a way that reflects our deep faith or our desire for deep faith, if we're struggling with our faith and this question mark of what does God want me to do? Will I hear from God? What if I bring something to God and God says nothing? What if I bring something to God and God says something I don't want to do? And I think that these questions, whether people are asking them or not, you know, are ones that people of faith are always carrying beneath the surface. And it, they are ones that can really trip us up. 
And I, for me, it's been helpful to think about the reality of the Trinity and how God, the father, God, the son, and God, the Holy spirit three in one. I think this Trinitarian idea is one that, that is deeply comforting to me when it comes to decisions, because they are, God is engaged in this divine dance with God's self and God invites us into that. And the same way that we cannot separate, really separate, you know, in any kind of definitive way, God, the father from God, the son necessarily, that there's a oneness in the same way. I now have been brought into that. So I cannot be separated from God, which means then, therefore, I am leading us to a, a logical conclusion that in a particular way, I can trust that as I am opening my hands and being a person in my everyday life, that I can trust that if there's something that I want, and I state that plainly, I can trust that God is big enough and patient enough and kind enough and intuitive enough to let me know if I'm moving in the wrong direction. And if I hear nothing, then there is a way in which I can just continue doing my next right thing that I deeply want to do. And all will be well. Now, that does not mean all will turn out well, that it's necessarily going to be, you know, the exact right thing. You know, those are things that I think as grownups, we kind of know, but sometimes it's not, the fear is not just that something will go wrong. The fear is that we are wrong, that we mm -hmm. are going to do mm -hmm. something profoundly terrible to mess up the whole thing. And, and that, that we're going to be to blame even before mm -hmm. God. And I just think that, that like, that's in, in Christ, as we are in God, that's a question mark that has, that has been kindly leveled out into a period. Like that's kind of been taken care of that. Mm -hmm. We are, I think about James Brian Smith definition of spiritual formation. He says, Spiritual formation is replacing our wrong ideas about God with the ideas Jesus has about God. And that mindset changes how I think about making the wrong choice. Mm -hmm. That That's so flipping good. Yeah, <laughs> just the, literally two hours ago, I'm sitting in a group supervision session talking about stuff and, it, and realizing that I, the question, I can't remember exact words. The question was asked to me of something like, cause I had said something like, I'm afraid that what I'll do, what I, what I have to offer will be insufficient. And that's how I was describing my moment of indecision and of what to do in this situation. And a very wise person kind of just threw that back at me. I was like, afraid that you, what you do will be insufficient. And I said, no, I'm afraid that because it comes from me, anything I do will be insufficient. And what I'm hearing you say is all will be right mm -hmm. with God, right? Mm -hmm. Like the question mark, am I sufficient has been turned into a period with God who says, yeah, to me, you are <laughs> like, yeah, which changes, like there's so much more freedom in whether my decision now is sufficient for the task or not. And that wraps around the conversation we just had about freedom, how I'm sure you say this in book, but freedom within limits, there is a Western culture period of freedom, which is kind of fearful because then it's all up to us. But then there's this freedom in God and freedom in knowing our limits, freedom in knowing that he is limitless. He mm -hmm. brought me along this Psalm 37, where it says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will act, making your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like the noonday. And it's kind of like all about decisions, <laughs> but... Yeah, that's beautiful, Brandon, how you kind of summed that up. Like you said, flipping good. <laughs> Emily, I think this is a great segue into like the the actual, I think, substance of your book, <laughs> which is the subtitle, right? Creating space. I Sorry, the subtitle. I've lost it for the moment here, but the, the soulful practice, which in the in the book you describe as creating space for silence, letting our souls know that it's safe to come out and making room to listen. I'm not sure if that's exactly how you said it, but that's what I have written down. I like that. Um, Let's write that down. I like that. <laughs> that seems like, I think what, what you have brought us to in this conversation is, can you just say more now about the soulful practice of allowing that period from God, I think is a way, maybe a way to ask it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's not really a question. 
There you go. How about, how about I say more words about it for you? How about that? <laughs> I'll answer it as if it's a question. Well, one of my favorites, Parker Palmer provides us with, for me, a deeply informative, transformative image. And that image is he writes in several of his books, actually, but one that comes to mind is the book, let your life speak, which I highly recommend tiny little book, great for any type of vocational transition or questioning or just life. But he gives us this image of the soul being like a wild animal who is tough, resilient, savvy, and self-sufficient, and yet exceedingly shy. Mm -hmm. And he, he invites us in his writing and says that if we want to see a wild animal, the last thing we should do is go traipsing and crashing through the woods, shouting for the creature to come out. But instead, if we're willing to walk quietly into the woods and sit silently for an hour or two, and I love that he gives a time frame. I don't know that I can do that for an hour or two, but stay with me with the image. If we would sit for an hour or two at the base of a tree, the creature we're waiting for may well emerge. Mm -hmm. And so this image of going into the woods and quietly entering into a space of patience, of patient silence, which let me tell you is just doesn't really come natural to us. Definitely not to me, but I think that that image is helpful because it reminds me that my soul is like, a, can be like a wild animal and is in the sense that it is shy to come out unless it knows for sure it's safe. Mm -hmm. And the question of what does it look like for us to enter into a soulful practice of creating space for our soul to come out? I will say it is often deeply difficult to do that alone, which is why I so deeply appreciate the art and practice of spiritual direction, because I think that spiritual direction provides us with, in some ways, like a body double to sit with us in the presence of God, to kind of keep us focused, keep us on task, if you will. And when I say on task, it's a real productive way to say being present with ourselves and with God and how God might be moving. And so for me, I would say spiritual direction is one of those ways, both as someone who goes as a directee. So I'd say my spiritual mm -hmm. director holds that type of gracious space for me, but in such a profound and weird way, I didn't necessarily expect sitting in the chair as the spiritual director, almost even more in some ways has been for me a practice of sitting still as I, as I create safe space for someone else's soul to emerge. Mm -hmm. I find that mine often does as well. And there's something really humbling about that, you know, as you bear witness to someone else's story. So I think that's, that's one thing, but I'll also tell you really practically this idea of, of, of being silent for the sake of being a person for the sake of recognizing God's presence with me. I, I do a very Western thing. And I literally will set a timer on my phone for a particular amount of time. Honestly, sometimes it's really short amount, five minutes. Mm. And my one job in those five minutes is to just sit still and be a person and just be present to whatever is. And oftentimes what is, is deeply distracting, is discouraging, is frustrating, which is why I'll get, I'll move. I'll often move off to something else, but the, what the timer does is it gives me Rachel, like what you were talking about, it gives me limits and within those limits, I have freedom because I know like, you know what, it's a short amount of time, but for these five minutes, my only job is to not have a job. My only job is presence. And maybe there's prayer. Maybe there's not. I would say that anything we do in the presence of God is a spiritual practice and it could be prayer. Sarah Bessie talks about every rhythm of our life is a path to prayer. I tend to think that's true if we do it with an awareness of God with us. So even sitting and with my phone timer in the year of our Lord, 2023, looking out the window for five minutes, wow, that can be a, a deep gift to my inner life just to have some calm. Now, if I set my alarm for two hours, would that, would, would my soul emerge even more? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Maybe I would just yeah. struggle that whole time. I don't know. But I think being aware of what is true and real, that's a helpful practice for me. You know, I heard naps are spiritual practices. <laughs> they are. They are spiritual yeah. practices. In Jim Smith's book, Good and Beautiful Life, the very first soul care practice is taking a nap. 
So there you go. It's real. It's written down. There you go. It strikes me that the commonality there is the, or one of the commonalities is the, whether you're doing it with somebody or doing it alone with God, I mean, always with God, of course, but different ways of, of experiencing and through repeated experience coming to know that it's safe. I think for me, that's one of the things that like the, as you talk about the sitting alone in silence, setting a timer, you know, prior life, I never would have done that. That would have been too scary. Having now done that much more, there's nothing particularly magical about the silence, but I'll tell you, I've learned I'm not going to die if I feel those feelings. Yeah. And that has been really, well, there's safety now. And I'm like, well, I can make it through five minutes. I can make it through 10 minutes, which, yeah. And I think that kind of goes to where you went, go next of the naming of unnamed things. You know, I'm sort of guiding through the book on the things that captured Rachel and I's attention, but naming unnamed things is terrifying until you've done it enough or been held your hand through it enough that it's okay to do it. Mm. Anyway, but that seems to me to like go right to the next. I see, I understand how that makes a connection to being able to make good decisions or make decisions at all, frankly, but I don't want to move on from this silent spot if you have more to say about that, but I would like to ask about the naming of unnamed things. How does that work for you? What advice do you have for those of us who struggle to let that unnamed stuff come up in the silence? Well, I think you're doing, you're doing a good job of leading us through kind of connecting the dots because really when it comes to decision-making, Iris Murdoch says at the moment of decision, the work of decision-making has already been done like Mm. on the spot. Like you, you, a lot of times we don't have a long runway to make a decision. It's like, Hey, are you formed to the degree that you can make a wise decision too late? Go. That happens a lot, depending on your, you know, your, your work, your life, your family, whatever the thing is. And so that's why this practice of silence, solitude, and stillness, this practice of reflection that I can't stop talking about. And this practice of naming what is unnamed within us is so deeply important because at the moment of decision, the work you've done will not, will not be in vain. Mm. And the work is knowing yourself, knowing God, as you know yourself, I I don't think those two things are separate. And I've gotten some pushback from some people in my life who will say like, well, you know, trusting yourself, that's anti-biblical or trusting God says there's nowhere in the Bible to say to trust yourself. And I want to say, well, you know, Jesus left, you know, he, he left earth and then he didn't leave behind written instructions. Like he didn't leave the Bible fully done. Like, here you go. He left a community behind of people who were flawed and were going to have to make choices and have to be discerning. He also left the Holy spirit, but the Holy spirit in communion with a people who have to make choices. And so it's not one or the other, it's, it's both. And so yes, trust ourselves learn to listen to ourselves, but not to the exclusion of everyone else, including God. And so I think that's, that's something that just as a bit of a side note to bring out, but this concept of naming the unnamed things, a couple things come to mind. One is Ronald Roheiser in his book, the Holy longing says we get into trouble whenever we don't name things properly. Mm. And I find that to be deeply true in my own life because the reality is what is true is true. What you want is what you want. What has hurt you, disappointed you, brought joy, delight, sorrow. All those things are true, whether you acknowledge them or not. But the reality is they are going to come out one way or the other. And so we, in our experience of our own lives, there's going to be fear, there's going to be shame, and there's going to be anger. And those things are living beneath the surface. But if we don't have a regular practice of reflection and naming those things that will otherwise remain unnamed, then those things are going to come out sideways without Mm -hmm. our permission, approval, or consent. And when those things come out sideways, things happen that we don't like. Mm -hmm. We get in weird fights with our family members. We do things we don't want to do. Mm -hmm. We say words we wish we could take back. We're short. We're sad. We, you know, and I'm not saying we can avoid all of those things. But what I am saying is I think we can 
avoid a lot more than we do if we engage in this practice of reflection and naming some of those unnamed things. Yeah. You talk about how, I think this aims perfectly with what you just said of paying attention to what you're paying attention to. And I absolutely loved that because Peter and I, my husband have been learning about this of how be curious about your emotions. Don't like you say, preach at your soul. I absolutely loved that. Just have compassion for your soul. Do not preach at your soul. But yeah, I would love to hear, I guess your just thoughts on like being curious about what like your reactions are, what your triggers are, and kind of maybe even suggest to the listeners like what to do with that curiosity. I mean, yes, we can bring it to prayer, but like, how do we, do we write it down? Do we talk like the community aspect of, I think you even mentioned like a no mentor and maybe there's other mentors in there. I jumble questions a lot, but I would love to hear your response to whatever statement I just made. (laughs) What I hear you asking is paying attention to what we're paying attention to. You agree it's important, but then what? What use does it make? How, Mm -hmm. How does that actually look? And what is the practice in order to do that? Almost like why maybe yes. you're like, why pay attention to what we're paying attention to? And, and I, and I guess in that, I would say there is something to, I'll just kind of state the obvious. Anything I say next is going to sound really small and almost like inconsequential, which is I do write these things down. I, I write them down to such an extent that I created a whole journal. It's called the next right thing guided journal. And in there are just list after list, guided list after list for you to write down. What am I grateful for? What brings life? What drains life? What are, what's one next right thing? And those are ways of paying attention to what you're paying attention to and doing it on one day might not make much of a difference. Even doing it for a week might not feel consequential, but let me tell you, you do that for 12 months and you look back over what you've been paying attention to, it can profoundly change your life. Mm-hmm. And that's my, you know, I wrote a book called Simply Tuesday years ago. And I, you know, often think about, you know, Tuesdays are the most regular day of the week. Pay attention when you're watching a movie or reading a book. If somebody wants to have a metaphor for like regular day, it's always Tuesday. They'll be like, well, what? We're just like hanging out on a Tuesday night. You know, nobody says Friday. That's too special. Saturday is really special. Sunday's church. Monday is the first day of the week. Wednesday is like middle of the week. Thursday is the best night of TV. It is Tuesday. That is like the most regular day. And I am a firm believer that what we do on our every day, eventually that is the most formative. It doesn't get the spotlight and it doesn't, maybe there's nothing to celebrate necessarily, But I think that paying attention and writing those small little things down over time can really build up. That's our way of kind of, that's, that's part of our formation. That's our way of preparing for a decision that we might not even know is coming yet. And so to answer your question, yeah, I write that stuff down, (laughs) like that's legit, write it down with my hand using bullet points. No, I absolutely love that. Brandon and I just got through Ronald Rollheiser's domestic monastery. And I feel like that's the exact message too. Yes. I'm so excited about it, but just that idea of like the everyday practices, the everyday small things inconsequential one day. Yes. But also in the long run of eternity. So formative, like you say, we're always going towards or going away from something. Well, and it brings it, it brings what is hidden, the unnamed things to a level of articulation that is unifying, right? I mean, like you can, there's a, there's a time when analysis is not helpful or I can be overly analytic about everything, but, but there's also a way in which taking what I feel and bringing it up and articulating it through writing or talking has a way for me of, of unifying myself, like yeah, my emotions and my thoughts and my they work both directions, but they, they do become one. And that allows for much more healthy, first of all, expression, but then also I think basis from when I have to make the decision, I kind of already know in some articulatable way where I stand on this or how I feel about this or whatever else. It also, I, I want to circle real quick back to the comments you were making that you said was an offhand comment, which I don't think is at all of, we can't trust ourselves kind of that, that mindset. And Partly, I just want to make a plug because I just interviewed 
a gentleman named Simeon Zoll on his book called The Holy Spirit and Christian Experience. And it's a very academic book, but he diagnoses some of the reasons we post-enlightenment thinkers have gotten into this. All things subjective are, are to be untrusted or not trusted. And all and and somehow we're supposed to have this completely objective, neutral view from nowhere on everything. And I I hear the tensions and I hear the fights. I get it. But we almost in our effort to be right in our decisions, in our thoughts and everything else, which I have a great affinity for, don't get me wrong, we edit ourselves out of the data, right? It's like the data is all out there. Those are all, that's all the facts I should make my decisions from. Whatever I feel, whatever I want, however I react to that, that just should not, that shouldn't even be in the set of data that I'm going to look at because it's untrustworthy. Yeah. And I'm like, well... I get it. I can be deceived, but your feelings about this are your feelings about this. And they're not wrong. They're actually telling you some really important information, sometimes about yourself, always about yourself. And more often than not about the stuff around you too. They're not, they're not infallible, but they're not wrong. Yes. And I think that that practice that we were talking about, Rachel, about writing down and paying attention to what you're paying attention to, it develops in us an embodied practice of of being able to name, not diagnose, there's a difference, to name what is true, to name mm -hmm. how I feel about something. And we might not always be able to say why, and it might not even be important to say why. But that practice then informs what you're talking about there, Brandon, which what comes to my mind is valuing all three centers of intelligence, not mm -hmm. just our thinking brain, but also our bodies and also our feelings, and that all these things, if we are in a regular practice of reflection and of paying attention to our own lives and to how God has moved in the past in our lives or how we thought God was moving, but maybe it was just not, I don't know, I think God's always moving, but there's all of these things that we're recording, then, then we, it will just be more natural to consider ourselves as part of this and not observers mm. of our own life that it will, mm. because, because we've already been engaged in recording mm. things. So therefore when a decision comes or when a moment of deep discernment is required, it's just normal and regular to consider mm. our own centers of intelligence, not just our head, but our heart mm. and our body too. Yeah. This might be off script, but I'm, I'm kind of curious. I guess it comes from my own struggle the practice of just listing. So the book, the the study guide, I guess, is, is that what you called it that you wrote for the- The guided journal. Guided journal. Thank you. Yeah. Right. See, there was my bias right there. It's got to be a study guide or it's, an, okay, never mind. But anyway. Or it's not invalid. <laughs> for, anyway, neither here nor there. But yes, it's funny that I said that. Very Freudian slip. Okay. The power of the writing the lists. Amen. I get it. Done it. And really have seen the value of doing that. And I confess, and here's my question, I really am resistant to it. Like it's taken a great amount of effort in some sense to do that practice. I think I want, I want to be able to name the unnamed things. I want to be able to articulate the feelings and know myself without having to write it all down. I look at lists in books and I'm like, eh. so my question is sort of, one, am I crazy? Two, have you felt that? And three. Help me out. How, if I think there are people listening who feel the same way. <laughs> yes. Well, let me ask you this. When you talk about resistance, is the resistance to having a list or to making the list or to something else? I love it when podcasts turn into spiritual direction sessions. Thank you so much. I don't know. I think, I mean, some of it is certainly just sort of history with Bible studies that are all lists, which is probably why the study word came out. But I honestly think more, much more deeply is the, there's some part of me that I think is afraid to put it all out there. Hmm. Right? Like, I think I'm, I think there's some part of me that judges myself for needing to list it. Why can't I just know? Hmm. Shouldn't I just know? I mean, I should already know all this. I shouldn't have to write it all down. Hmm. Say more about what you mean by out there putting it out there. feel very exposed already. That makes a good podcast. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's, I think putting it out there, meaning, well, I, I can remember being early stages of some therapy with 
years and years ago, and this being some of the advice I received and practice that I did, which was journaling my feelings and being able to speak as freely as I wanted to, right? So as many curse words as I wanted to put out there. And it wasn't that I had a struggle cursing in my journal. It was more that once I started doing it, some of the darkness within me that comes out is scary. Yeah. And I struggle with that being like, it has to, I know it does. Like I have to get it out there. I have to give it compassion. and allow it to be there, even if it's bad, truly bad. But I think I'm still scared sometimes of naming what's really in here sometimes. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you for answering my questions. Because I think you're exactly right in saying that you're you're not the only one who feels that way. And and just to get really practical about it, there might even just be something about the fact of the word journaling or writing something down. Like I'm a writer, so that comes very naturally for me. But someone else who like that feels that might feel like homework or that might feel heavy. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I think of the words of Jesus, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. You know, we know that that doesn't mean we're not going to do hard things, but it does mean that we're not going to do them alone. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that if the practice of writing things down is just such a block to you or just to someone listening, if it feels like such a block, then maybe don't do it that way. I Mm -hmm. think that the, the, the point is not necessarily the writing of it down. The point is the act of reflection. And and I do think just like I believe, I really do believe that if God wants to move us in another direction and we're open to hearing that, then we'll know eventually, Mm -hmm. you know, we might go weirdly for a while, you know, but I think eventually with God, we're going to be all right. And I think the same is true with if the practice of writing it is just a little too scary right now, don't write it. But I do believe that in the same way God is with us when we go down weird roads and make our decisions, I think God is also able to bring things back to mind that we need to know when the time of decision comes as we do the work of reflection, even if it's just in prayer, even if it's just embodied, like, well, I'm going to take a reflection walk now and I'm going to be with what's true and I'm going to name it out loud in the presence of God and trust that if this needs to come back to me, if this is something I need to review, that God is wise enough and patient enough and smart enough to bring it back to mind when I need it. I think for me, the reason why the simple practice of writing things down, first of all, I like the idea of bullet points because we don't have to use complete sentences. It's less intimidating that way, but it's just this, the mere fact of having something that I can look back on later, like the next that year. And it helps me make decisions for the year to come. But, you know, you can burn that after, like, no one says Mm -hmm. you have to keep it. We don't have to keep this for the kids. (laughs) You know, this is not, you know, that type of thing. So I, I think I'm, I'm answering you kind of on a surfacey level, but I think your question is deeply profound and important. And it's one that is not easily explored in one answer to the question, but I do think it, it definitely touches on something that I think a lot of people just initially will tune it out because it's like, oh, I'm not, I don't Mm -hmm. like to write. I'm not a journal. Mm -hmm. It's really not about the writing. It's really about the naming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and that, I mean, it strikes me too, that that's like, in some ways, this is a plug for a lot of different things, right? This is a, a plug is probably the wrong word, but like an encouragement, right? If you can write, if you can't write, go for a walk and yell or talk. If you can't do that, whatever. Yeah. It's the naming that matters. And this is a great example place for us to say, like, I found this space. I needed therapy first. I've used spiritual direction. Writing came later. <laughs> Yeah. Whether that, you know, partly because I needed somebody else to actually be in the room and tell me it was okay to say these things. Mm. So, but yeah. So if that's somebody listening, let me just say that to you as well. That's good. Yeah. Find the space where you can start to do the reflecting because it's, you will be, you will be glad you did. Mm. I do want to be aware of our time and your time. I would, I'd kind of like to jump to the question that of all the stuff that's in the book, there's a lot of stuff in there. What are some of the, practices, bits of things that that have stuck with you particularly that are kind of your favorites that you can, I mean, you've already said some of these, but that you really do still hold on to yourself in this space. Well, a lot of them, but just to, I'll name three. One is the idea of, of picking what you like and seeing how it grows Mm. that so many times we're afraid of like choosing the wrong thing, but, you know, being at the flower shop kind of taught me, like I felt 
paralyzed and indecision about which flowers I should bring home and plant. And I had this thought, like, just pick what you like and see how it grows. And that concept is applicable in a lot of areas of life. It's not just at the flower shop. So that's one that I continue to circle back to. A second one is that mo that monthly on a monthly basis for probably 10 years, I have written down what is life giving and what mm -hmm. is life draining. And the goal is not to only do life giving things and avoid all the life draining things, but in naming them, it helps me make decisions in the future because I remember like I've written down, this is life draining for five years. Why am I still continuing to arrange my life to where that keeps happening? And again, sometimes we can't avoid it, but in those things we can, it's a helpful list to have. So I call that a life energy list. What's life draining? What's life giving? And then I, I would say a third one that comes to mind is the practice of choosing your absence. And, and on the other side of that is planning your presence. But I think choosing our absence is sort of like the opposite of fear of missing out. You know, we've got FOMO. I'm afraid I'm going to miss out. But what about those places where I decide to miss out? Because mm -hmm. I think, you know, I call myself a soul minimalist, you know, intentionally elevating the things that matter most and getting rid of the things that don't. And this idea of choosing your absence is is a real practice in doing that. And that literally can mean on your calendar, choosing things I'm just going to say no to, or can also mean choosing my absence from engaging in perseverating over a particular grievance that I have. I'm just going to choose my absence from that. And that too is a way to, you know, bring some space in our souls, mm -hmm. which to me, in order to do our next right thing, I think creating space for our souls to breathe is, is just a huge part of that. So those are a few that come to mind for me. Yeah. Thank you. Just, to, just as we close, is there, I don't know, is there something that you wished we would have given you the opportunity to say a question we should have asked? I don't know, something you'd like to bring to the table that we haven't thought of? Well, you brought up wonderful things to the table. I think the only thing I'd say in closing is this, this idea of doing the next right thing. I think a lot of us can get tripped up on the word right and mm. I would just encourage us, if we could, to elevate the word next, that really that is that is the real focus is just what's the next thing as I live life with God in my community and with myself, what's the next thing? And then again, tomorrow. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. It's It's been a great joy. Thank you for the free spiritual direction session. I didn't expect anytime, it, but anytime. I, <laughs> so, yeah, appreciate it. And Rachel, thank you. It, great questions. It's been fun reading this book with you. Rachel is swiftly becoming kind of the, the office reading buddy. She and I are passing books back and forth. So we're having a great time. Yeah. I think that's all listeners. I hope you enjoyed this and Emily's book easily accessible. You grab it anywhere. I think it's kind of all over the place right now. It's been out long enough that I found it really quickly. So we'll put a link to it in the show notes and uh, yeah, definitely pick it up. And thank you. May the grace of Christ go with you wherever the road takes you. Thanks for listening. This podcast is a production of Signpost In, a nonprofit Christian ministry dedicated to helping people connect with God and find direction. We offer spiritual direction, retreats, and lots of other resources like this podcast. Please visit us at signpostin.org to learn more. We especially want to thank our generous donors who support our work and keep this podcast going. If you've benefited from something you've heard on this show, please consider supporting us by making a tax-deductible gift at signpostin.org donate. That's signpostin.org donate. And thank you.